my name is Miles, Miles Irving, and uh, managed to find a way to forage for a living. A typical day you'll find me wandering around in the woods on a salt marsh or something, gathering stuff and uh, taking it back to London to, to supply to various restaurants that we uh, deal with up here. The Wombles of Wimbledon Common, what do they do? They use the things that the everyday folk left behind and I think that's what foraging is all about. It's, it's, uh, it's not necessarily just about the fact that things are wild, it's about the fact that here's things that, here are things that you can use that uh, are freely available and um, it's kind of making use of them. It's looking at Providence as, as something a little more straightforward than carving up areas of the rainforest and sowing soya um, where it wouldn't normally grow. It can be a bit simpler. A lot of people say that they don't know anything about foraging and they'd be a bit nervous to go out and gather wild plants. But if you press yeah. them a bit, you generally find they've been picking blackberries on and off all their life. Maybe they've picked a few chestnuts as well. And I always say, well, you know, that makes you a forager. But there are these kind of multiple layers as to why you would forage and why you would use wild food. Obviously, flavour's a great one. Having another reason to get out on the heath getting to know a place based on what grows and getting to know it through the seasons, these are all lovely things. The advice I give to anybody is, is once you get started is, is just learn a few plants um, one at a time. Start with something simple. Um, nettles is a great example, dandelions are a great example, elderflowers and elderberries are, are pretty easy. Botanical characteristics are helpful because when you're, when you're trying to identify plants um, it's really helpful to be able to narrow it down to a plant family. When I first started out, I'd find a new plant, and unless you're just lucky and open it on the right page, my basic method was to start at the beginning and look at every single page, and just hope I got lucky, you know. And then if your illustration just at a slightly different stage, or slight variation, because the plants are not always the same, you're stuffed. Whereas, if you can get something, look closely and think, aha, these are, uh, these are obviously ray florets and disc florets, or in this case, just disc florets. Um, you can say, well, it's in the daisy family then. So at least all your page flicking is just going to be narrowed down to um, the little section for that particular family. And it's just anything that helps you kind of lump things together. It helps you to remember it, that's what I found. As soon as I started finding all these links between plants which I didn't realise had any connection, I suddenly, you know, it's like you've got more pegs to hang them on inside your brain, really. This tree is the hawthorn, it's part of the rose family. And the main characteristic of the rose family is that it, it bears fruit. And uh, often fruit with stones in the centre, although that's not always the case. But if you think of all our stone fruit that we cultivate, such as cherries and um, plums, damsons, peaches, apricots, all of these plants are um, members of the rose family. There's um, lots of green spaces in London. Um, I'm not a Londoner myself, so I don't know all of them, but you could have a good look on perhaps Hackney Marshes, Hampstead Heath. You know, the plants are still here and we're still here, so we can, uh, we can reconnect and um, make it part of our culture now. Brand new wild food culture for the 21st century.